Okay. Good morning, Thomas, Kiran, those who all those who joined in, uh, Kanan and Neelam. Um, let's get started. Um, okay, let's uh, pray and then we'll start. Let's pray. <clears throat> Come, Holy Spirit, we, we invite you in our midst. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your presence, Lord. We, we just invite you this morning. Come, have your way among us. Come, Lord, open our eyes, open our ears. Lord, we come with open hearts. Yes, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us, that you, you would write your word upon our hearts. Father God, we thank you. Uh, for ministering to us. We thank you for drawing us to yourself. We thank you for wonderful work of your spirit or in our lives daily. Lord, where would we be without the ministry of the Holy Spirit? We thank you for speaking to us, for strengthening us, for ministering to our hearts, Lord. We just want to thank you. And uh, we give you all the praise this morning. We give you all the glory, even as we submit ourselves and uh, this time into your mighty hands. Yes, Father God, lead us, guide us into all truth. Lead us, Lord, guide us, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so last session, we last class we finished with the, we completed First Corinthians, and we moved into um, chapter one of uh, Second Corinthians, right? Um, so First Corinthians, uh, does anyone remember where it was written from? Which place did Paul uh, write First Corinthians? Anyone? Where did he? Um, from where did he write First Corinthians? Anyone? Okay. Okay, I'm going to put some um, Ephesus. Okay, right. Ephesus. Ephesus was uh, where he wrote First Corinthians from. Okay. Um, when it comes to... Uh, okay, so Second Corinthians, where did he write it from? Okay, was it again Ephesus? Was it um, Lose? Where did he write it from? Any idea? Okay, I think, uh, yeah. I think Dave and Aaron are correct. It is Macedonia, from Macedonia. Okay, So Macedonia would, um, uh, like we studied last class, Macedonia includes the, the whole area, would include uh, four cities, right? Uh, Neapolis, Philippi, Thessalonica, and also Beria. So the Macedonian region would in, include these cities. And Paul wrote uh, Second Corinthians, uh, while in Macedonia, and uh, there was a, you know, as we as we see as we uh, go through the epistle, we see that he was in um, great uh, discomfort, great uh, yeah, you know trouble, um, physically, emotionally, etc. And then so he he narrates that also right in the epistle. Okay, so um, first epistle, first Corinthians probably was written around fifty three or fifty four A.D. Uh, second epistle, Second Corinthians, was written probably around fifty-six or fifty-seven uh, A.D. Right. So this is uh, this is of course uh, uh, an approximate uh, date. We don't know the exact uh, year. Right. Okay. So um, in in chapter one, let's just review quickly review chapter one. Okay. So chapter one, we uh, Paul starts with the same way he writes all his epistles. 
uh, he introduces himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And Timothy is also mentioned there. Uh, he says, and Timothy, our brother, and uh, to the church, which is at Corinth, uh, with all the saints who are in Achaia. Okay, so it's not only for the intended audience for this epistle, it's not only the believers in Corinth, but also the surrounding area. So uh, Corinth and also, uh, you know, so when you say Achaia, it'll, be, it'll include Corinth and Centuria, right, the surrounding region. So the churches, the believers who are there, this is meant for them, right, the saints who are there, he says. Okay, so, and, uh, and in the same manner, he addresses um, the saints, he greets them, and uh, he declares God's peace and God's grace over them, right? Um, okay, then he goes on to talk about uh, the comfort which he has received from God, okay? And uh, the comfort which he has received, he says, God is the f- a father of all comfort and all mercies so he says this is um this is he's the father of all comfort father of all mercies and he comfort, comforts us in all our tribulations okay so which means that he is there every ever present and uh, he is a comforter in all our tribulations in all our difficulties right and uh, tribulation the word used there uh, the Greek word means it's a lot of pressure, um, a lot of uh, something. It's as if something is pressing down, you know, uh, that kind of a trouble and that kind of a problems that he's been facing. So it says, in amidst all that, he received the comfort from God, and he says, God is a God of all comfort, and so. Um, and so he, uh, he says that God comforts us in all our tribulations so that we might comfort others with the same comfort that we have received from God. Okay. Um, so, and, and then he goes on to say that you also, you Corinthians are also, um, you know, partakers of this comfort. Even as you go through, you are also partakers of the comfort. And uh, if we go through any tribulation, which means that if we go through any tribulations of this nature, or any tribulations at all, then we are, it's an opportunity for us to receive this comfort from God because he's the God of all comfort, right? Um, so, uh, and as, you know, verse 5, as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so also the consolation, which means that it's not like the consolation and the comfort which we receive from God, it's it's not just for, you know, certain certain kinds of problems, certain kinds of difficulties, says, even as it, or certain uh, levels of difficulties, he says, even if as the levels of uh, difficulty increase, so also the comfort from God, so also our consolation from God. Okay, so, um, and then verses 8 to 11, I think that's where we stopped, I think, no, verse 11, um, let me see. Um, yeah. So verses uh, 8 to 11, uh, he said, no, I don't want you to be ignorant. You know? And we saw that you know, this is um, a similar usage uh, of Paul. When um, even in while talking about the gifts, he did not, he said, you know, you, you, you Corinthians, I don't want you to be ignorant about the, uh, about the spiritual gifts. Regarding spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be ignorant. So saying here also, he's saying, you know, I don't want you to be ignorant or without knowledge about the kind of persecution, the kind of trouble that we underwent in Asia. Okay, verse 8. And uh, the fact that we were burdened beyond measure above strength. Okay, which means that it, it came in a, you know, uh, in a beyond measure, which means uh, we c- it cannot be measured. You know, it was like that. And above strength, above all the capacity for us to even bear that, right? Above strength, so that we despaired even of life. We thought we would die. Okay, verse 9. Uh, when we had the sentence of death in ourselves, okay, so um, like we, we saw that, you know, this uh, sentence, the, uh, the the judge passes a sentence or a verdict after all the discussions and deliberations and all, after all the presenting of the evidence and the facts, the judge passes a sentence, which means that's final. Okay, so he says we carried, we had the sen- sentence of death in ourselves. So, which means that, um, you know, people were after them in that manner, right? saying that there is no other option, you know, you need to, uh, you need to die, right? And it's all for the sake of his faith, right? Uh, we have the sentence of death in ourselves, 
that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. So he's saying, you know, we had the sentence of death, so we can't trust in ourselves. Because our strength is anyway, he says, it's it's above our strength, beyond measure. Um, but we had to trust in him who raises the dead. So he's saying, this is God who, uh, uh, you know, we know the death is a final thing. Like uh, So he's the one who even raises the dead who changes even that circumstance, that situation around. So we trusted, right? So uh, we trusted in him who raises, raises the dead. Verse 10, a very encouraging verse. He says, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. And so uh, we see that he's the same unchanging Lord, unchanging Jesus of the past, the present, and the future. He's saying he did this in the past. He delivered us. Yeah, we know he delivers us and he will continue to deliver us. Right? And, and also he says that you also helping together. Okay, so that's, um, so we, let's look at that. He's saying you also, del uh, you're also together, helping together in prayer for us. Okay, so he's saying you interceded, you you were um, you know praying for us, uh, and uh, you were in intercession for us. You, know? to, you were helping together in prayer for us. That thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. So saying that you interceded for us, you inter uh, you you were in prayer for us, and the gift that is the grace of God was extended to us um, through the prayers of many right so so that helped us as well right so they so um this paul is acknowledging the the fact that uh, this the ministry of intercession right when people pray together the ministry of intercession, and many times he would he would also ask uh, the believers to pray ask the church to pray right um so he he knew the importance of prayer of uh, intercession and here it says uh, you know god helped us and you helped through your prayers right? okay let's read uh, verses 12 13 and 14 okay for our boasting is this the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity not with fleshly wisdom but by the grace of god and more abundantly towards you. For we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand and even to this end, as also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast, as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so he's saying, you know, our boasting is this. You know, the, when we when we talk about uh, you, you know, this is our boast, the testimony of our conscience, right? Saying our conscience, the way we conducted ourselves, the way we behaved, the way we lived in the world, and uh, is with sin simplicity and sincerity, and not with fleshly wisdom. But by the, by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you, say, saying, you know, the, we can actually boast about this. What can we boast about? We can boast about uh, the fact that our conscience is clear, right? The testimony of our conscience, our conscience is clear that how, the way we conducted ourselves, the way we lived our lives in speech, in, you know, in thought, in action, in the world, in simplicity and godly sincerity. So he's talking about two things. One is simplicity and sincerity. And this is how the opposite of that being pretense. Right? We didn't pretend to be someone. Okay? Uh, sincerity. We were sincere. And also uh, in, in godly sincerity. And also with sim simplicity. Right? We, uh, we were not uh, trying to be someone whom we were not. Or we were trying to uh, live a life that we, you know, uh, uh, we were aspiring to live a different kind of life, but the extravagant life. No, we lived in simplicity and sincerity. He says, we did not live with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. Okay, so it was not just with earthly, fleshly, carnal wisdom, but by the grace of God. 
which means we dependent on the we were dependent on the grace of god okay so when we again just to remind us about the grace of god we know that it's the favor of god something that we do not deserve we also know that it is the uh, it is the the enablement of god divine enablement of god we also know that it is godly character right so so we see that uh, paul is saying that we were dependent on the grace of god and not not dependent on fleshly wisdom not just carnal unrenewed wisdom but we were dependent on the um, on the grace of god okay and uh, which we see and he says you know and more abundantly towards you okay verse 13 and so we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand now i trust you will understand even to the end so um so he's saying that there is no hidden meaning or something that we want to say uh, in our writings um nothing you know uh, other than what you read what you understand it's very plain we don't you know communicate we're not communicating something uh, and intending our motivation is something else like when we say that you know what we write what we communicate is what we are saying you know so because uh, you know some people can do that right they say something but what they mean is something else okay even though they might say okay it's so good to see you and in their hearts it is not what they mean right uh, they they are not really meaning from their heart but paul is saying that what we wrote to you is exactly what it is we didn't mean anything else um so we're not writing any other things than what you read or understand and uh, he's saying you know i hope that you will do that uh, even to the end so he's talking about you know clear conscience and he's also saying you know about all their communications the way they lived uh, and the way that and whatever he wrote to them it is uh, it is very plain there is no hidden agenda okay so something for us to learn as ministers of god these are all lessons okay okay so um verse uh, verse 15 okay in verse uh, 15 he is actually uh, talking about declaring um you know explaining something um and it's about his travel okay his ministry ministry plan <coughs> excuse me so he's explaining um his uh, ministry plan and something that he did not he said he would do and he did not do so he's just explaining that right so let's read from uh, verse 15 onwards and in this confidence i intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit uh verse 16 to pass by way of you to macedonia to come again from macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to judea therefore when i was planning this did i do it lightly or the things i plan do i plan according to the flesh that with me there should be yes yes and no no but as god is faithful our word to you was not yes and no for the son of god jesus christ who was preached among you by us by me silvanus and um timothy was not yes and no but in him was yes for all the promises of god in him are yes and in him are men to the glory of god through us now he who establishes us with you in christ and has anointed us is god who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee moreover i call god as my witness as witness against my soul and to spare you i came no more to corinth not that we have dominion over your faith but our fellow workers for your joy for by faith you stand and then second chapter uh, he just continues with the same uh, subject right so let's look at these a uh, few verses so he's saying uh, you know i intended i wanted to come to you okay i wanted to come to you uh, that you might have a second benefit benefit of what benefit of his him being there with them and him ministering uh, god's word to them okay and he also uh, explains why he did not come okay so so it, this is in response to maybe a possible accusation okay people may have said okay paul does not keep his word okay uh, he said he would come but he did not come so he's not he's saying one thing and he's doing one thing you know 
possibly there was some kind of a talk like that in the Corinthian church. So Paul is addressing that, right? So he says, um, uh, because, uh, you know, when we look at 1 Corinthians 16, let's um, look at that. Probably I'll just, um, um, you know, share that. I'll just project that here. Um, just a minute. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, you're able to see it, right? Okay. Fine. So, um, so we see um, here. Yeah. No, I'm just putting this so you don't have to turn um, again. Okay. So we see, um, you know, one Corinthians. 16 5 to 7 um so here he says you know i will come to you when i pass through macedonia for i am passing through macedonia um, and it may be that i will remain or even spend the winter with you that you may send me on my journey wherever i go for i do not wish to see you now on the way but i hope to stay for a while with you if the lord permits so you know he's on his way to macedonia and uh, he says you know i will I will pass through, and uh, and then I will, uh, you know, on, I will come back and I will remain. Okay. Now on the way to Macedonia, uh, I I'm not going to visit or stay. So that's what he says, right? In in the um, in the previous epistle, uh, that is what he had communicated to them. But something happened. He changed his mind, and on the way to Macedonia itself, he visited them. And this visit seems to have been a very difficult one. Okay, something that uh, uh, some people that he had to confront, uh, some corrections that he had to bring, something that he saw that which was not good. And so, uh, so as he on the way to Macedonia, as he stopped by Corinth, which was not his plan, but he stopped by and he saw certain things which were, um, you know, which were not good. We are going to look at that. So after that, he seems to have written to them. Okay, now that uh, episode or that letter, we don't have a record of it. Okay, we don't uh, we don't have a record of it. Uh, we don't know, you know, about the contents of that letter. But all that we know is that it was a very severe letter. Okay, uh, which means uh, that it was a very um, strongly worded, uh, strict uh, letter, bringing in correction. Okay, so, so he, um, uh, so it was something that he wrote, um, and and therefore he thought, you know, on the way back from Macedonia, he thought, let me not visit Corinth. Okay, uh, so because it was a very unpleasant visit, the first visit itself, he had written to them a very strongly worded letter, and so uh, he did not visit them on the way back. So, so that is why he's explaining, right? He's explaining all this, and uh, so this is what I planned. But then he said, um, verse twenty-three, right? One Corinthians, um, uh, verse twenty-three says, "I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you, I came no more to Corinth." Okay, so he's explaining that. Okay, let's. Uh, uh, so let, let's just look at. Um, uh, verses 17 okay verse 17 therefore when i was planning to do this do i do it lightly or the things i plan do i plan according to the flesh so he's he's uh, very clear you know his plans and everything is is not according to the flesh but according to the spirit of god which means that he is dependent on the spirit of god um and uh, he's uh, dependent because you know even in the book of acts we see that uh is very very um, uh, sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, so um, so an approval of God, right? To the re suppose God said, "Don't go into this uh, region now." Now is not the time. He did not go. He and his team did not go, and it's very clearly recorded for us in the Book of Acts that um, twice, and uh, it happened that uh, the Holy Spirit prevented them 
right stop them from going to entering into into a, a, a particular region right so he um so he very clearly uh, was sensitive to the leading of the spirit and so um and so he, you know he, the plans that he makes he says it is not according to the flesh okay um and then he goes on to say you know as god is faithful our word to you was not yes and no right so when we when we speak something when we give a commitment it was not yes and no it's not um it's not something that uh, that we will go back on any commitment you know? verse 19 it says for the son of god jesus christ who was preached among you by us by me silvanus and timothy um was not yes and no but in him was yes so he's saying that you know as the son of god whatever the son of god promised whatever the lord jesus promised um you know with him it is not yes and no or yes or no um so the, so we it is the lord jesus whom we preach so his character and his nature is when he says yes it is yes it is not say yes and he means something else the way the lord jesus says yes uh, he mean, when he says yes it's yes when he says no it's no so so he's saying you know for the son of god jesus christ uh who's preached among you by us was not yes and no but in him was yes for all the promises of god verse 20 in christ okay in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of god through us and right? so for all the promises of god are yes are sure are, are something that it is it is yes and amen okay uh, so it is not something which we which god has promised which he will go back on so he's talking about the in christ promises okay so we know about the in christ promises we've studied the in christ promises in the course who we are in christ um so Uh, in in the previous episode also he says you know that he who is joined to the lord is one spirit with him 1 corinthians 6:17 and 1 corinthians 1:30 right but of him you are in christ jesus okay and in, in romans 8:1 also there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in christ jesus so in christ jesus we we are as believers we are recipients of certain blessings we are recipients of certain promises okay and all that has been promised to us by the father because of our spiritual union with christ are yes and amen okay which means that they are for us and it is not yes and no but yes and amen right these are for us to receive and these are our inheritance and it is for us to walk in Okay, so Paul mentions that uh, uh, when he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and when he when he's talking about the uh, promises of God for us as believers in Christ, they are yes and amen. Okay, um, verse twenty one is talking about how uh, certain certain words that he uses in order to describe our relationship with God and relationship with one another. Okay, so he says now he who establishes us. with you in christ and has anointed us is god he verse 21 established which means to make firm right to make firm to make sure he who establishes us with you along with you in christ who is it it's god okay, then he says he who has anointed us is god okay so anointed again meaning filled empowered um and used for his service prepared for his service okay the greek word means to smear or to rub with oil and why do we do that in order to set apart to uh, consecrate for holy use okay so something that is consecrated is not used uh, for a, it's not used commonly but it's set apart for a special use right so he says you know this is what christ has done Uh, he's established this is what god has done he has established us make us firm uh in christ and he has also anointed us separated us empowered us filled us and he is the the father has done that uh, in christ verse 22 who also has sealed us 
and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Okay, so he uses the word sfragizo, um, uh, sealed, which means that you know someone who 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 with a signet ring, like someone in higher and authority, like a king or a or someone like a minister, who whose ring carries authority, and they use that ring in order to put a seal. You know, it could be on a written proclamation or a place. And why do they do that? That seal signifies um, signifies ownership, possession. Okay. It also signifies that the whoever on whom the seal is put has come under the authority or under the protection of that person. Okay, or you know, it could be a property. It could be uh, it could be some. Uh, a decree order that is passed when the seal is there when that uh, seal when that symbol is put it means that it is from that authority it represents that authority so it's words of that authority orders of that authority and if it's on a property if it's on some uh, you know um, some possession it means that it is it comes under the authority or it is the possession or it comes under the ownership of whoever has put that seal okay so here he says he, he has sealed us which means that he has made his mark he has put his mark he has put his um that symbol that uh, authentication upon us okay so that's a that's the thing that we belong to him that we are his possession and we come under his authority okay so he who he, uh, who also has sealed us and what else did he do he has given us the spirit in our hearts the holy spirit is in our hearts as a guarantee and the word used there is it means a pledge it means a down payment or a deposit okay um, so a down payment or a deposit or a pledge it means that this property or this possession or this product it belongs right it belongs to the person and the payment has been made the pledge has been made the initial deposit has been made so for the believer the indwelling presence of the holy spirit is like that pledge there's something that is going to happen in the days ahead or in the years ahead uh, in the life of the believer where that possession will be complete or well uh, that process will be complete. What will that process? The process of salvation, right? The entire process of redemption. Now that redemption, salvation will be complete. How? When we receive our glorified bodies, right? So that redemption will be complete. Salvation, the whole salvation. You know, we have received salvation, and uh, we we are being. You know, uh, we are walking as people who are sanctified, and they, we are receiving salvation of our souls, which means our minds are being um, renewed. We are being saved in that, in that sense, but we will be saved. We will be completely. The redemption will be complete. You know, when we when that happens, when we see him face to face, when we receive our glorified bodies. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is the pledge, the guarantee, the Greek word arabon, which means that uh, it's a deposit. Holy, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit is our initial payment, initial deposit, and He has come to live in us. Okay. Uh, Holy, He has given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Okay, so He's talking about all this. You know, He's established us. He has anointed us. He has uh, sealed us. Uh, we are His possession, and He is also our guarantee. The Holy Spirit indwells us. He is in our hearts as a guarantee. Okay. So verse 23 says, Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul. Okay. So again, you know, he's he's just presenting all these evidence, and it's like a case, and he's uh, uh, you know, like all these arguments, strong arguments. One is stronger than the other, right? Now he's just building up and he's saying, uh, moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you I came no more. So this was the reason. To spare you, I already had, you know, written to you uh, a severe letter, right? So, uh, how do we know that 
in the next chapter, actually, we know second chapter and verse three. And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow um, upon sorrow and so on. You know, so um, so he says that um, this is what happened. You know, this is the reason to spare you. I did not want to. Uh, I did not want to add any more to your sorrows. To spare you, I came no more to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over your faith. Okay. So, um, so he is again stating that, you know, of course we are ministering, but we do not have dominion over your faith, but we are fellow workers for you with joy. For by faith you stand. Okay. So we do not, we do not have dominion. We cannot boss over you, over your faith and dictate things to you, but we are fellow workers for your joy. We are co-workers for your joy and by faith you stand. Okay. So with that comes the end of the um, end of chapter one. Let's move on to chapter two. Um, and it's a continuation. Okay. So he's talking about, okay, this is the reason I did not come. Okay. I do not want to make you even more sorrowful. I did not, I wanted to spare you. Um, let's read chapter two and the first few verses. It says, For I determined this within myself that I would not come again to you in sorrow. Okay. Why, why what happened? Because the previous visit, there has been a lot of it's it's not an unpleasant one. Um, there were a lot of things that were not right, so he had to correct them, he had to use strong words, he had also written to them uh using strong words. So you know, the, so he's saying that I determined this within myself that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad? But the one who is made sorrowful by me. And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow over those whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction, and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you should know the love with which I have, uh, which the, the love which I have so abundantly for you. So, so again, he is repeating and reiterating that this was the reason for his decision not to visit and his reason for writing, right? And, uh, so we we learn something, you know, the heart with which he he actually wrote to them. It was very strong. The content of the letter was strong, and the content and the way he corrected was also strong. But but the fact is that it is part of the uh, discipling and disciplining process. Okay? It is it is not always welcome, but if if that is uh, if it is uh, accepted, if uh, that correction is accepted, then it results. Uh, the results are good. Okay, but you see the the motivation and the uh, and the posture of his heart when he brought in that. You know, he says uh, with much um, sorry, out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote. Okay, so so he was going through all these emotions. Uh, there was much. Uh, affliction and suffering and you know anguish of heart and uh, with many tears he says so emotionally he was actually down with many tears he wrote uh, and not to grieve them but they should know the love so which means that it was a uh, you know in in even in that act of correction and disciplining it was an expression of his love because he was doing that so that they would walk uh, or they would come out of unrighteousness they would come out of sin and walk in righteousness so that was his only intention right so um so we see that uh, you know he he writes to them right okay and um, yeah let's uh, let's move on verse 5 but if anyone has caused grief he has not grieved me but all of you, to some extent, not to be too severe. This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man. So that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. 
for to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things for now sorry now whom you forgive anything I also forgive for if indeed I have forgiven anything I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ in the presence of Christ lest Satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices okay so um so saying that uh, this person he doesn't name the person but he's referring to the person's uh, act and the behavior and uh, we see that uh, he refers in the previous epistle right we see in chapter 5 where he uh, in 1 corinthians chapter 5 he talks about the immorality or a person who is continuing in such a immoral lifestyle right so he he addresses that he talks to he talks about that he says you know you you ought to be uh, you're not grieved right and he also brings in uh, he says you know this is how we we need to put him out of fellowship okay and he says i have handed him over to satan right and and that we also looked at that right this act of handing over to satan what was it it was actually putting a person out of the fellowship of the church okay so we 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 see that um uh, uh, him doing that right so so he here is uh, saying you know this was done and uh, now obviously uh, it seems that the person had repented okay so he's saying verse 7 you ought to forgive and comfort him lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow so uh so it seems that this person has come uh, as repented and this discipline has worked so you know reaffirm your love so he's saying you comfort you reaffirm forgive and uh, you know take that person back into the fellowship okay so we see um you know three things here no we see that sin has to be addressed okay but it has to be addressed in a in a manner in a firm firm manner okay sometimes it's a very tough decision and uh, and paul took that decision because the consequence of not taking that decision uh, that tough decision was that the rest of the body right the rest of the church would also be influenced okay there would be influ- there would be consequences of that because everybody would know that such a person is living that kind of a lifestyle it was a sexually immoral lifestyle right and uh, it was something like an incestuous lifestyle also so uh, if it was not addressed then everybody would be talking about it and every, maybe some of the young people would also be influenced by it um, we do not know so the he said you know a little leaven leavens the whole bread whole, whole dough Oh, that's what he said um in one corinthians 5 we read about that right so so he had to make that strong tough difficult decision right and it was to put that person out of the fellowship of the church in other words he was he was asked not to be part of that church unless he changes his life so um so which means that even before that he was repeatedly told and he did not change now here after that decision he seems to have changed repented okay so saying that's why he's um he's uh, encouraging the believers corinthian believers to to forgive them forgive him and comfort him and reaffirm their love for him you know so you know that's that's again we see both sides of it we see the toughness of the decision in correction and also the readiness to forgive once the repentance is seen right the readiness to forgive that person the readiness to um, receive that person comfort the person and uh, and reaffirm the love reiterate the love for that person so we see both happening here okay um so he says um paul uh, uh, uh urging the church writing instructing the church 
and he's saying you know i have also forgiven that person for your sakes in the presence of christ okay um so so he has done that in the in the previous letter okay so that is what in that firmly worded or strongly worded letter also seems to have had this instruction okay verse 11 he says lest satan take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices you know we do this because we don't want to want satan to take advantage of our uh, uh, of our lives okay they should satan should not take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices we are not uh, so let's look at some of the words here so advantage which means to be to gain something to be covetous or to do something in order to uh, in order to defraud right so uh, we don't want satan to do that to us right? and he says we are not ignorant we are not you know we, it's not that we are not without knowledge about his ways of working okay about his devices and the greek word used there means uh, a, a perception or an evil purpose you know we we are not ignorant we are not without knowledge about his evil purposes and the ways of working okay so and what is it it is to maybe destroy the church divide the church and uh, bring in uh, make the church ineffective right so so he's uh, he's warning them you know uh, we don't want satan to take advantage okay right let's look at verses uh, 12 to 17 onwards and uh, yeah so maybe i think we have another minute uh, well, so why don't we uh, any questions so far you know maybe probably if there are any questions from what we have seen anything that you want to share okay so one of the things is that uh, there is you know between first corinthians and second corinthians there seems to be have been a epistle uh, or a, a letter that was written uh, and uh, and it's not part of the it's not part of the bible for reasons maybe it was just a you know an instruction right a correction instruction um, so it's not part of the bible so there is one letter in between that which he has he seems to have written okay um, that is one thing that we see here and also the other thing that we see is uh, paul's attitude towards uh towards bringing in correction you know even though um he he was very firm in certain things he was uh, very firm and very decisive and said okay this has to be done um this has to be done and uh, you know but when he and when he wrote to them also you know people they said you no know, his letters are weighty meaning his letters uh, were, were very strong Uh, the incontent you know whether it's the truth revelation of god that was uh, that he was communicating or when it came to correction but from paul's side he says you know that he wrote with so much of anguish and pain and tears and so uh, he knew it had to be done but it was emotionally he was going through all this but despite that he brought in the correction despite that he communicated to them firmly that what he was doing was wrong and they needed to change so on okay so um yeah we'll take a break and then we'll come back uh for uh, and continue